So hello and welcome again to JOSPT Asks for another week. Um, JOSPT Asks is the weekly chat where you, the audience, get your questions answered. <laughs> I'm Claire Ardern, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of JOSPT and it's really great to be chatting with you again this week. Joining me today to answer your questions on summer chromial pain and the rotator cuff is Professor Laurie Mishnah from the University of Southern California. Many of you will know Laurie's great work as a physical therapist and certified athletic trainer, as a shoulder researcher, in the clinic training the next generation of physical therapists and you might have also come across her fantastic work as vice president of the American Physical Therapy Association's Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Welcome to JOSPT Asks, Laurie. Thanks, Claire. I'm glad I'm here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on today. And I think we've had such a great response on the um, Slido with all of the questions. So clearly subacromial pain and um, or shoulder pain, the rotator cuff is uh, an area of the body or a, a clinical challenge for many of us. So let's get straight to the sorts of terminology that we might be using. When I read the research, I end up getting pretty confused because people talk about all sorts of different things when they refer to shoulder pain. So what should what are we talking about? What sorts of terms should we be using? Well, originally we had kind of three categories in these people who had rotator cuff problems, if you will. There was a partial thickness tear, there was a full thickness tear, and then there was tendinopathy. We then started using subacromial impingement to indicate the mechanism that we thought these tendon tears and or tendinopathy could be occurring from. But as we progress through the, the research, we can start to see that there's evidence that indicates it's not commonly impingement that's occurring in the subacromial space. It's likely less common that impingement is the mechanism. So early on, um, or early on, I'm sorry, a couple years ago, Ann Quills and I wrote an editorial in uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine about what should we call this? I don't think we've landed on any kind of consensus that it's a single term. People use a couple different terms, but one that uses impingement is probably the less one that we should use, meaning the um, one that is less optimal because impingement isn't the primary mechanism. It's likely loading to the tendon. So calling it subacromial pain syndrome, calling it rotator cuff um, uh, disease or disorders or rotator cuff, um, I'm blanking on the rotator cuff, I'm blanking on the uh, other terminology we typically use as well, but I've rotator seen, cuff or something. Yeah, and I've seen rotator cuff related shoulder pain, lots of Thank really you. long words. Yes, rotator cuff related shoulder pain is probably um, also a very common uh, terminology that's now currently being used, but it implies that there is something in this, this pathology or region of uh, the shoulder that is related to their symptoms, but isn't identifying a very specific pathology, even with rotator cuff related shoulder pain, it's implying a whole spectrum of rotator cuff pathology that could be the cause. Okay, and so then when a patient comes to see you, how are you talking with the patient about what this problem is? Are you, what sorts of terms are you using and how are you framing the problem with patients? Because I think the language that we use with patients can be really important. Mm -hmm. I, I put them in that either subacromial rotator cuff related pain, if it's in this tendinopathy slash uh, non-tear uh, group. If they're in a tear group, that full thickness tear, I think is a really different scenario with these patients, these older patients, full thickness tear or traumatic and a bit younger, that's an acute tear or if it's acute on chronic, but that deserves a different bucket. So it's a subgroup under that rotator cuff related shoulder pain. Okay. I think giving them a directive with respect to what the likely general area of shoulder pain is, is helpful to patients as opposed to, I think one of the questions was, should we just call it shoulder pain? And I think that may leave patients frustrated and not able to potentially identify but not giving them a very specific pathology and the language that, listen, you know, the pathology is never going to heal like in a full thickness tear. So that implies you'll never get better, which is definitely not the case. Nice. So that positive framing rather than setting up something that's going to um, 
perhaps catastrophize or, or be a negative thing. Correct. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. So thanks for clearing that up. Let's move now to the first step when the patient comes in to see you and, and we're trying to do an assessment and a diagnosis and try to figure out what's going on. How do you approach diagnosis when someone comes into you and says, I've got shoulder pain? Perhaps let's start with the um, electrician, the middle-aged electrician who's having problems reaching above his head to do work um, above shoulder height work. So I, I think of uh, my exam as two main purposes. One, I'm trying to put them into a bucket of what I think is likely happening that can help inform prognosis and general treatment decision-making. And so what I mean by general bucket is, is it likely this rotator cuff related subacromial something bucket? Is it somebody who has instability? Is that their primary diagnosis? Or is it somebody who's likely too tight in this adhesive capsulitis? What is the primary pathology and or symptoms that they're presenting with? And then there's obviously other categories as well, but I'm taking the major three there when I say that. And so that is the first thing I think about. I wanna understand where they go, because that can help drive prognosis and my, my general treatment strategies. The second thing I think about my exam is, what do I need to know in order to drive treatment? So from a physical therapy standpoint, I also wanna be assessing range of motion to understand, do they have full passive? Do, do they potentially have some limitations that I need to address in treatment? But that assessment of passive range, after I exclude them from the, the adhesive capsulitis category, that assessment of passive range isn't helping me with the general diagnosis, but it is helping me drive treatment decision-making as a rehabilitation specialist. Okay, so can you just go back those three categories again, where just, re just to recap the three main buckets that you're putting them in? So subacromial pain slash rotator cuff. I, I feel like I always say slash because it's such a large bucket, I don't settle on one term, but let's just call it for today, rotator cuff problems. And so we fit them in one bucket, the instability group, and that could be frank instability that could be subtle instability as the primary driver of their symptoms and then uh, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder that uh, might also be the synonymous term. Great, thanks. So, and I think these three um, buckets or, or categories are gonna come back through the discussion that we have in the next hour. So good to have that set up from the outset. What are some of the questions that you would ask a patient specifically in a history to get to tease out some of those things and try to figure out which of the three categories this person fits into. What are you listening for from the patient? So that general history exam, people who have insidious onset of pain or traumatic in the rotator cuff could be either. And people have insidious onset of pain could be more likely that adhesive capsulitis, they don't come on as a traumatic, but they have could have a history of traumatic before they ended up stopping to use their arm and that might lead to adhesive capsulitis but that trauma we tend to think about mostly for that instability but it could be in those people who have subtle instability but that's their primary could also so it's helping me to understand how that started that might then what was the precipitating event that started and so history questions how often do they have shoulder pain is it constant or intermittent helps me with the rehabilitation guiding, meaning if they're so highly irritable, they have pain all the time, I'm putting them in a highly irritable and thinking about my management strategies immediately that I'm trying to help reduce them from con constant to intermittent pain, for example. I'm asking them if they have pain with overhead activity, asking them if, what's their primary complaint, if they say I have difficulty moving my arm because it's really limited, that's helping to guide me towards one of those. And so kind of the classic questions that I think we ask patients in that history examination. And are there, we talked about pain as a symptom. Are there any other particular symptoms that you're looking out for, for each of these three categories? Um, with respect to their pain levels? Yeah, or I was wondering with the um, stiffness ones, are you asking them particular questions about stiffness or, or tightness? Uh, other sim uh, symptoms other than pain. 
Mm -hmm. So do you have stiffness, correct, with that adhesive capsulitis or feelings of instability, asking as well, which is not typical maybe in an elbow exam necessarily. We don't think that as a, as a high category question, but for instability, do you have feelings of instability? Have you dislocated your shoulder, been told that you do that? Do you feel like your shoulder wants to come out of joint? Those types of questions for the instability group. Okay. And I think also to add here, really important in the exam, is some type of screening with respect to psychosocial factors. Um, in my clinical practice, I'm not asking um, in-depth questions about all of those right from the start, but if I'm suspecting that there is some overlay of psychosocial factors, I particularly like the OSPRO uh, published in JOSPT a couple years ago by um, a group out of University of Florida, Steve George, and uh, who's now at Duke. But I find that questionnaire quite helpful because it looks at 11 parent scales, but you only have to ask 17 questions or even as minimal as nine uh, or 10, I believe. I use the 17 one to screen anxiety, depression, pain, catastrophizing, other psychosocial factors that can impact the progression through rehabilitation and their outcome of care. And how frequently would you think about using that questionnaire, Laurie? Is it a one-off? Is it every time you see the patient? Definitely not every time I see the, a patient. Um, if they come in with a pretty easy, straightforward history question and, or, or presentation, and they seem to, in that first visit or second visit, really don't demonstrate any kind of psychosocial in my conversations with them. So, for example, I say, so what do you expect your recovery to be? Do you expect to recover from this problem? And they say, oh, yes, I, I expect to recover. Right? Do you think physical therapy is going to be helpful? Yes. I'm not having an index of suspicion that there are other factors that are coming in play. So I, I, even though the OSPRO is quite short, I probably use that in 25% or less of my patients. Okay. And what about differential diagnoses? What are the sorts of things that you're looking out for there? With respect to um, ruling out other things or the special tests? Let's deal with ruling out other things first and we'll come back to special tests. Uh, asking to understand either index of suspicion that indicates do I need to refer them out? And so is there a suspect of a past history um, or an, a past history of cancer, for example, and now they have shoulder pain, they had a past history of breast cancer, I'm suspecting is there metastasis somewhere, or am I can't reproduce in my clinical exam their shoulder pain? That's making me say they need to be referred out, and potentially I could be treating them concurrently as they're also being worked up for another part of their exam. If they're having um, systemic signs of increased temperature, et cetera, that's making me suspect something else like an infection that's going on, or they have a deformity, I'm suspecting that, oh, is there a fracture? And then with the shoulder, it can obviously not always be obvious. There's lots of soft tissue around the scapula, for example. Scapular fractures are not common, but they can occur. And so if my exam, again, is not making sense with the musculoskeletal, I'm referring them. So it's, yeah, it's really about building that clinical picture and, and using your clinical mm -hmm. reasoning skills to put all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's talk about special tests now. Are special tests really special? <laughs> how, how special are special tests? How special are they? Oh gosh, it, the shoulder has so many special tests. Erin uh, um, Sasha from uh, the University of Kentucky when he was there. Um, looked at how many special tests there are for the shoulder. And I think at that time, and this was probably five or six years ago now, 208 and counting. Why do we have so many special tests? Because a lot of them just don't perform well. And there's so multiple, there, I always say in the case of a shoulder, musculoskeletal shoulder pain, I assume there's more than one pathology until proven otherwise. And so tests perform differently in the presence of different pathologies concurrently with that. So it makes special tests of the shoulder very difficult. I think about special tests to put them in these general three buckets. And then if I need to keep doing some other things to potentially tease out some more, yes, I might. But really keeping special tests to a minimum. Um, I think some people think we shouldn't be doing any special tests. It doesn't matter. We should just say, do they have musculoskeletal shoulder pain or not? 
and then use our clinical exam to drive treatment decision making. Do they have tightness? Do I want to stretch that, for example? Um, I think it's very helpful to put them in these pathological categories to generally drive treatment and also prognosis. Because, for example, we know that people with full thickness rotator cuff tears that are small in size typically respond very well to conservative treatment. In fact, 80% of patients in two years generally say they aren't opting for surgery after being diagnosed and going through a conservative rehabilitation and followed up for two years. So I think that pathology can inform our decision making on some global level about prognosis and general care, but it does not tell me exactly what I should be doing with the patient and how I should guide them through rehabilitation. So do I use special tests? Yes, but judiciously. And it's not the end-all be-all to driving treatment decision-making for rehabilitation. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest challenges we have with special tests is that we could um, look at the other side and see that there's a whole lot of pathology that perhaps is not symptomatic if we did an MR or if we did some kind of imaging to both shoulders. And so the, the idea that we could do this special test and that tells us the source of the pain is perhaps um, not as helpful as what we would hope it, it might be. Yes, absolutely. There's so much asymptomatic pathology, just like in the low back, for example, that's, you know, you just don't know if that's the cause of their pain, even when they do have shoulder pain. Okay, so let's let's just finish off our assessment and measurement so, um, group of questions and talk specifically about um, strengthening or about strength assessment, about testing rotator cuff strength, because I think this might be um, one of the core parts of your clinical assessment. And perhaps you'd walk us through the core parts of your clinical assessment for each of these three different um, clinical categories. So assessing shoulder strength. Yeah, that's uh, uh, very interesting. The, I just had was mentoring a resident last week in the clinic about um, assessing, uh, of all things, lower extremity. I should have been on two weeks ago with Lynn, um, assessing lower extremity. And, you know, it's a return to sport. And so he said, ah, I think I, you know, can just do some annual muscle testing. I said, oh, so you think you can figure out the difference between four plus and four minus and four? There's no constructability to that. I don't know if you have magic hands. I don't. I can't figure that out. So we need to have more objective testing if we really want to assess the quad. If people, and this goes for the shoulder as well, when we get up above three. And so a handheld dynamometer is required. If there's not a handheld dynamometer, the next best thing can be a one rep max or even a 10 rep max that you could do with your patients to understand. Clearly, if somebody says post-rotator cuff repair, I'm not doing that in week two. I'm looking for activation of the cuff when I'm starting table, when I am able to start strengthening in that patient. And then when I need to really make a more um, uh, specific assessment of the rotator cuff when I'm looking for return to work or sport activity, then I need to use a handheld dynamometer because I can't discern between a, a four and a five. Can you just come back to your one rep max? Which exercise are you doing your one rep max? So it may be lying on the sides. It may be in a cable column fashion that I may use to adjust that. So there's multiple ways to do that one rep max. It may be laying on the side as I continue to add weight. I find the cable column really nice to be able to use because I can keep changing that a little bit easier than what I put on their arm, but using that one or 10 rep max that you could even use for these patients. Right, so you, then you're picking which position you want to assess, which whether you want to look at external rotation, whether you want to look at a different muscle group. Correct, and I can say that, you know, there's evidence that indicates what we are able to do at the side is, is pretty correlated to what we can do up above. However, I'm looking at a return to sport in an overhead athlete. I definitely want to also look at their handheld dynamometry strength or one rep max. I would find a little bit more challenge to do up here but being able to do that in a seated uh, or an overhead position, in a functional position. And also saying that I think is critically important is stabilizing the handheld dynamometer. Early on in my research lab, when we looked at um, measuring shoulder strength, I had two DPT students who I set them on the task of looking at test, retest reliability and their healthy other PT students. 
and they show me the numbers and I'm like, oh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 ICC. That seems a little low. This handheld dynamometer should be better. Ah, we're holding it. As soon as we developed a very simple vice grip stabilization device on a door jam and stabilized the handheld dynamometer, our numbers are never under 0.95 because realistically, that stabilization, and that's critical when we're in the clinic, especially if multiple people are testing over a longer period of time, we need a stabilization device. And there's lots of them out there, even on the market that you can purchase, or you can facsimilate that with a belt, like handheld dynamometry for the quad and using the table, for example. But I'm stabilization so is key. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that. Thanks, Laurie. What about um, dynamometry, so um, uh, isokinetic dynamometry or other functional tests? I love isokinetics if you have it. So if you don't have it, um, that's you know not necessarily always in every clinic that I've been into. And so using a handheld dynamometer, I realize it's a price point enough to purchase one up front. It can be $500 to $1,000. If you're really... Um, good engineering or had a background in uh, um, uh, construction. My father was a, a contractor. And so I think, ah, oh, I can just purchase a small load cell and can I hook that up and record that? That's a little more challenging to rig that up than buying a handheld dynamometer, but that's really important. Um, functional tests. I think every patient, no matter what, who and what they're trying to return to, has to be doing some kind of functional testing. And I know there's some questions about return to sport that we'll get to later, but functional testing and what they need to be able to do and facsimilating that, that may be very specific. And can they do those repetitive activities with the loading that they're gonna be able to do is required. So that might be about you getting a bit creative in the clinic and using the equipment and the space that you've got. Mm -hmm. And I can also say, um, I think I made a comment on Twitter this past week. Oh yes, what are this a knee for? To carry the shoulder around. So that's the importance of the knee. But I'd really like to point out um, some of the research we're doing with baseball players now are looking at really the lower extremity and trunk contributions to mitigating force at the shoulder and elbow as they're pitching and or throwing if they're position player. And so I think that's critical no matter who you're talking about. It could be the um, 62 year old female who's returning to low level tennis or low level activities, they need core and lower extremity as well. And so I've seen patients who they come in, they've had lots of rehabilitation somewhere else. Their shoulder actually looks pretty good, but when they're trying to get back to activities, which may be even the, somebody who's doing overhead work at a post office, for example, lifting things that are very light, looking at their lower extremity and trunk was poor. And so I send them home with lower extremity things and they look at me like, wait a minute, you know I have a shoulder problem. Yes, I think you have pretty good shoulder function and your exam looks pretty good. It's this that's contributing to when you try to return to a whole body function. And everybody uses their whole body. So I think that's critical to look at. I like to use a simple star excursion balance test or a Y balance test in patients with shoulder pain or a single leg squat, I find it's incredibly helpful to assess how well they can control their trunk as they're doing like a step down. It's really telling asking somebody to do a single leg squat or a step down. Wow, great tips. And that, uh, that idea of not forgetting that the shoulder is connected to other parts of the body is, is a really powerful message. Thanks, Laurie. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think in assessment could be to come back to this idea of scapular dyskinesia and um, or scapular dyskinesis. Can you share with us your thoughts on scapular dyskinesia, how you may or may not incorporate it into an assessment? Let's say it's straight up, first thing, bottom line up front, scapular dyskinesis is not a diagnosis. Let's just lay that right out there. Eric Hedges would be proud of me to say that immediately. Um, We've had many conversations about this, but uh, the scapular dyskinesis can be critical in some patients, but the vast majority of people have some level of dyskinesis. The evidence indicates that people are generally not symmetric, that the vast majority of people, 75% of people look asymmetric. Even when we do sophisticated examinations, 
or if we do a visual examination that lots of people are asymmetric. And so the presence of asymmetry is not likely indicating anything that we need to worry about when we're examining the patient. When we look and see if there's obvious or just subtle dyskinesis, that also doesn't necessarily indicate that that's related to their shoulder pain. We published a paper in JSPT um, a couple years ago uh, looking at the presence of dyskinesis in people with and without shoulder pain, and it's about the same prevalence. So now we start asking ourselves, so how do I know this is important? To me, it's if I modify their scapular motion, be it during a dynamic exam, statically positioning and reassessing some other provocative test that they had pain with, if that changes their symptoms when I move the scapula or stabilize the scapula, then it's meaningful to me. So I think of symptom modification tests are the critical piece. In my clinical exam, a lot of times I don't, I don't even look and see is there abnormality of the scapula and spend a lot of time with that. Rather, I look if I see that it, as they're elevating their arm, just if I help the scapula through elevation or as they descend, does that modify their symptoms? Now it's saying that's a window for me to say, what else do I need to look at in the scapula versus of scapular muscle activation in those different positions or length of other structures that may be limiting that motion that may be impacting their ability to get that scapula in a better position as they elevate. But I only found that out by modifying the scapular position or motion. So let's move to management. I think that's a nice segue into some of our management approaches. So can you share with us how you would approach load management in patients who come in with shoulder pain? And we can perhaps talk about load management in terms of your three clinical categories. So load management in these people with subacromial pain, um, kind of starting with the bottom line up front, I think that we are likely, even in full thickness tears, probably in rehabilitation, um, not loading them enough. We likely are loading them. We are definitely loading them as we're doing strengthening with them. Um, but as they keep progressing through rehabilitation and they're starting to feel better, I think we don't load them enough likely to make sure they continue in that last bit of piece that's critically important. And following up with the patient then, um, even a month or two later, I typically try to follow up with patients to make sure have you continued to progress and make sure they're loading enough through that? So we think about uh, loading. Can they have pain when they're loading? Yes, but is it too much that it lasts my, my um, clinical set of, uh, my, my clinical experiences, if they have more than two out of 10 increase in pain that lasts more than a couple hours after they're done exercising, then before they start exercising, that might have been too much load if it's impacting their ability to be able to recover after they've loaded. And so it's not just loading within the tendon that may be giving them pain, but also in and around the shoulder joint because other things have been compensating for that. So I think about loading and monitoring their pain while they're loading and during the recovery phase. And what sorts of questions are you specifically asking your patient here or what are you what are you sort of guiding them to keep tabs on when they're exercising at home? So you, it's okay if you have a little bit of pain during that. So, you know, think about what the pain you have before you start. Then as you are exercising, it's okay to have an increase. But listen, a couple hours later, you shouldn't be wanting to call me and saying, what did she give me to do? This is terrible. It's now killing my shoulder. I kind of try to put in a global term. And then I, if for people, I don't think all patients have a good sense of this, and I don't want them to focus on so much about pain ratings, so I don't do this with all patients. But you know, if you take your pain measure, like a temperature beforehand, and then a couple hours after you're done exercising, it should be back down to about that same. If it's not, you've probably done too much. And sometimes it's a global assessment. Other times it's asking them to think about how would you rate your pain both before and a couple hours after. One of the specific questions that came through on Slido was about when is it safe to start strength training after a rotator cuff repair? How Can you talk us through how you approach that strength program or that um, program from sort of starting initially and right through the whole progression of the strength training? Yeah, rotator cuff repair is, is 
is such a variable animal compared to, I keep referring back to two weeks ago, the ACL repair. I realize ACL, you can have a, a variety of other pathologies occurring, but with the rotator cuff repair, I, it's, it is highly variable. There is a size of the tear that you have to consider about how aggressive you're starting with strengthening. It is also, how, what's the tissue quality related to what they saw during surgery? Is it pretty precarious? And they also had to put a lot of tension on the repair to get it back to its footprint. All those things really make you consider how aggressive you are with strengthening. If people have a two tendon tear that's likely related to more massive tear and they had kind of crappy tissue, toilet paper-like tissue is what people describe that commonly as, and also um, have a difficulty in generating activation even early on, we're really you know, careful about how we progress those. Um, and really monitoring being able to accept load with that. And so they might be held back a little bit more, but generally, when do you start strengthening? Scapular strengthening can be started early on, in fact, in those first couple weeks. When do you start rotator cuff? Really, most people say at eight to 12 weeks. Eight weeks, if it's a small tear, good tissue, and even then gentle activation of the, of the rotator cuff. When I'm doing isometrics, it's not full on, it's submax just activating and then progressing through that. So patient sitting, how, what sort of position do you get them doing the activate the rotator cuff activation exercises? Is that sitting or lying down or? I like to have, if I'm if they're doing isometrics, I'd like to have them standing. I like to ha even them have them standing in a straddle stance, kind of getting that trunk core activation, working with that and then um, using it against the wall with a towel, but I always give them the cue of, I should not see the towel compressed so much that I can't see the towel anymore. That means you're pushing too hard and teaching them what submax really means and lower submax, definitely on the early side. So I like to do it in, in standing, forward flexion, external, internal. Internal, no, if they have a subscat being very careful, that's low level. External rotation, being very careful early on, obviously with the majority of the rotator cuff repair. And once you've got past that initial isometric activation stage, then what are you starting to move into? What sorts of exercises are your favorites in that sort of middle phase where you can do a bit more? So isolated, just like um, uh, quads, isolating that rotator cuff can be really helpful in really making sure that the cuff is recovering but being careful with too much loading because the cuff is doing the majority of that. Posterior deltoid is as well, but being careful about how much you're loading there. A nice other exercise to really get some cuff repair are these salute kind of exercises that are really quite nice to get rotator cuff and elevation at the same time. Also working on some elevation, but unloaded early on. Could be a forward punch exercise, which is also really nice, but even shortening the lever arm, they may not be going the whole way out to really start to activate that cuff without high loading early on past that isometric phase. And then moving on to, to progress to the functional exercises, because that's ultimately where we're trying to get to. And perhaps if you mm -hmm. work with a soldier, the salute might be, might be <laughs> functional, but for many of our other patients, the salute is perhaps not so functional. So what sorts of tips can you share with us about progressing shoulder exercises from the, um, that sort of middle phase to the really functional exercises? So getting them up in those overhead positions and that salute, you can actually get them to behind the head, which is really important if you care about combing the back of your hair. <laughs> and so getting them up into those positions, getting them up to those functional positions in those classic early on PT school, PNF, getting them up into those overhead multiple plane positions and having them exercise in multiple planes, be it from these kind of exercises, meaning a, a, a lawnmower type exercise, for example, that you're pulling from below, but also these nice repetitive kind of proprioceptive uh, engagement exercises and stabilization up uh, with a ball on the wall, for example. But really these SAS post rotator cuff, 65 year old patients need to get their hand overhead. And so this ball on the wall and bouncing exercise, for example, is not just for an athlete, it's for all patients, I, I believe. And how much of this, Laurie, are you encouraging people to do in, say, their local gym versus at home? 
Uh, it depends on the type of exercise. More recently, we just um, have started looking at status posts, uh, sorry, not rotator cuff repair, but full thickness rotator cuff repair and using exclusively a closed chain exercise approach. And so we've, um, it's a, a Smith press kind of rack uh, that you might do squats in, but there's some additional bars that we've added. And then you can use some bands to help offload and do some pull-ups um, and push-ups and different exercise that I would have never thought to give a 65-year-old full thickness, two tendon rotator cuff repair. But they've worked out really well um, with respect to recovery. So we've looked at these patients and said, um, first did an EMG study and published that uh, in Journal of Electromyographic Kinesiology. The activation of the cuff and rotator cuff and deltoid and scapular muscles generally are much higher in these closed chain exercises. And before you ask, most people would say, ah, oh, that's because you're loading the whole body. Of course, they're greater than they are in an open chain analogous comparator exercise. But we loaded them a 10 rep max, had them come in, and these were healthy individuals first, loaded them in a 10 rep max and said, okay, here's what your, your dose should be. We're going to have you come back and put on EMG electrodes and perform those same exercises that you did as your 10 rep max and have you do a 10 rep again. And now we're going to compare these closed and open chain. And still the closed chain had higher muscle activity. So when we employed these exercises in patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears, they did really well and they had already gone through rehabilitation in some form or another before we saw them. And so people recovered doing. Uh, yoga handstands, for example, I was really surprised at this small cohort of patients that did really well. And so employing closed chain, we did with full thickness, but I really think it has translation to these folks for um, other uh, lower level, like tendinopathy as well, for load to the tendon. Wow, that's really interesting. What about, so let's continue on our rotator cuff theme. Um, and one of the challenges, I think, is with the patient who you've been, the patient's been working hard, you've been working really hard and just not making progress. How do you approach shared decision-making with patients who are considering whether or not to have rotator cuff repair surgery? So people with rotator cuff, I think I mentioned earlier, 80% of, did I mention this earlier? 80% of patients do well, um, uh, non-operatively at two years. The the threshold for that was they don't pursue surgery at two years. They may not have recovered full function that they need to do their activities. So they may modify their activities because they decide modifying their activities is a choice they'd rather make than pursuing surgery. And so I think that's part of the shared decision-making. They're static, they're they don't have surgery. They have a full thickness tear. And do they want to have surgery because they're not satisfied? What are you not satisfied with? And so I think they um, asking them that, and is surgery likely to help them recover with that? Oh, I have a little bit of pain. I'm not sure surgery may be the answer to recover their little bit of pain that you have when you do some exercise and or functional activities. But also what is their goal with surgery? Is it that they can't really get their arm overhead? And if they have surgery and if they're they're able to have surgery, meaning they're able to get this tendon back closer to the footprint. Will that improve their function? And most will say it's improvement of function is what they're getting towards. That would dictate likely that surgery is the best option at this point. I can say though that we still don't know the answer. Um, in these people, even with small full thickness tears that may be 50 years old, and should they have surgery, can they do well with non-op? They go through a whole bout of non-operative care and they do really well and they're returning to function um, and they're able to do most of what they want. We still ask the question, are we kicking the can down the road? Meaning, are we just putting off the inevitable? And when they get to that point, is now their tear um, not as operable? Uh, meaning they won't have as good prognosis with, with repair because the tendon tissue may have either tear got greater and or the, the associated tissue muscle and or related tissue may have decreased in their, their um, 
uh, quality so that the repair is not as optimal. I, I think that's a question, you know, that do we, people can do well with non-op, but there is some chance that listen, their tear may progress and inhibit their ability to really get the optimal care later or with surgery. So let's let's take a different patient population because I think this, mm -hmm. this um, stepwise approach to looking at load management and then coming back to the decision about surgery is also relevant for the athlete with um, instability. So mm -hmm. young athlete comes in, young throwing athlete has problems with instability, comes in to see you. What is your initial approach to load management? And then we can come back to the surgery discussion um, a bit later. Mm -hmm. So these people with instability, especially young, and I mean, I think they also need strengthening, but it's really strengthening at the right place at the right time during their different motions. And so it's a lot more in the generic phrase of motor control, motor activation. So it's a lot of more precise, can they control their glenohumeral joint and scapula in order to interface at the glenohumeral joint. So my approach is a lot of assessing through different um, ranges of motion and what positions they need to be in, starting in those positions that are a bit more easily able to activate, moving into those positions that are likely more unstable for that position, the generic, the majority being the anterior instability, and can they control those positions, and then can they activate well enough. Neuromuscular electric stimulation can be really helpful, just like it can be um, in even people with rotator cuff. Um, so that can be quite helpful in these instability, but a lot of assessing and reassessing their ability to control that. I think the difficulty with this though is our, our innate ability to really assess small motions at the humerus. The, the reliability, just like palpating and assessing um, spinal mobility is very difficult. And so being able to feel this subtle motion about the humeral head it gets me back to thinking about how special are special tests that be careful that you start to believe that you think you can assess, you know, a millimeter of motion. I'm not that good. I can't do that. And so really assessing these larger motions, their ability to activate and maintain can be quite difficult, especially if it's very subtle instability. And when you are working with these athletes, are you asking them to, are you paying attention to pain or, or feeling of instability? What are you asking them as they're doing this strengthening program? Enough times they may not have that much pain. Early on, I think it's more simple, uh, their pain, and they're in this highly irritable state. That's much easier, I think, to reassess. When we get into this middle range of these moderate irritability to low irritability, that they're progressing back towards higher function, then this ability, this feeling of instability is what I'm asking of them about. So how do you feel here when I get them in provocative positions? Do you feel any sense of instability? And then I am palpating, but again, I, my belief about being able to really assess those subtle instability is, is limited. And so I'm asking the patient about instability. And to wrap up this discussion about the instability, the athlete with instability, when we get to the discussion about sh about surgery, um, how are you approaching that shared decision making discussion about should I have stabilization surgery or not? Um, so that also shared decision making um, piece that I said earlier, asking what their goals are about having surgery. Well, I feel this instability now, and no matter I've done different exercises, that feeling of instability is not going away. Surgery can definitely help to reduce that instability, but realize that may reduce the motion that you then have, so those shared decision-making. I also think to globally asking the patient, and this kind of goes back to guiding rehabilitation that as well, is what are your functional goals and has rehabilitation move you towards that? So this kind of goes to outcome measures. Asking a generic shoulder questionnaire of some sort, I like the pen shoulder score, for example, um, and asking those specific activities, those patient specific activities. What are you having difficulty with? What are the three things that you wanna do that you can't do, patient specific functional scale? And then I really like um, this, this pass, this patient acceptable symptom state. I really started that with research. Um, when we tried to look at changes in outcome and clinical trials, we'd say, well, they got down to 20% disability, that's great, but we weren't sure what to think about that 
and how to understand who's a responder and not. Then we started using this pass, and now I find it incredibly helpful to use with my patients. So if left the way you are today, six months from now, would you find that the pain and disability that you have would be acceptable? I think that's incredibly helpful to ask the patient that. And so as a research tool, yes, I, I like it, but I like it even more for my individual patients because it's trying to get an understanding of the function that they have. It may be only 2%, but they say, this isn't acceptable to me, even though it's down to 2%. That 2% is really important to me. It's not acceptable. And that goes to shared decision making. I really want to look for other options. And I think one of the other areas of shared decision making is about imaging. So, in what mm -hmm. situations would you consider referring patients for imaging? So, we think about kind of earlier on in the conversation today these red flags and when you would refer out, suspecting those reasons. So, that's one. And then, two, outside those red flags. Now I'm halfway through real rehabilitation and the patients ask me, so uh, should I get an MRI? I mean, I, you don't think I have a full thickness tear. I don't fit most of the profile, but I still have pretty significant external rotation weakness when I'm trying to do some functional activities. Do you think I should get imaging? My question back to them is, and my thought in my head, I should say, is, is it gonna change the management? That's the number one question you need to ask. And I should do full disclaimer, I'm married to a radiologist, and that's what he asked me as well, you know, and says, when people refer for imaging, is it gonna change your management? And if you get the answer to this imaging, if it's not gonna change your management, then you shouldn't be getting the imaging. It's an unnecessary cost and time and energy for the patient and the healthcare system. It makes no sense. But if you're contemplating surgery and you wanna look and see, hey, listen, there is a tear and I really wanna understand if I am eligible for surgery, that's a different story. So if it's gonna change the management, by all means, yes. Outside of the red flags we talked about earlier. Okay, and one more in the, in the management block of questions. Your opinion about manual therapy, using manual therapy when managing shoulder pain or other sorts of um, adjuncts like shockwave, ultrasound, laser, these types of things. So um, I can start with uh, shockwave first. That'll be the easier one for me. Um, I don't employ shockwave here. We don't, I don't use it as a therapist in the US. Um, evidence kind of seems to be equivocal now. Early evidence seems to indicate that it was really helpful in people with um, calcifidic tendinopathy that was uh, uh, identified on imaging. So if there's image identified calcifidic tendinopathy, shockwave could be helpful. Early evidence seemed to indicate, now it's kind of equivocal, may or may not be overly helpful with respect to outcome. Manual therapy. That is an equivocal uh, answer as well. Some systematic reviews indicate it can be helpful. Other systematic reviews say the addition of manual therapy may not be beneficial. My bottom line take on this is, if a patient really um, benefits from a manual approach because they really respond to a lot more manual contact with the therapist, that makes me think that they would be benefit, benefit from that. Um, examination and patients with shoulder pain, for example, examining their thoracic spine and seeing some dysfunction and saying, oh, that's what I need to do. I, we don't have any evidence to support that we really can really reliably assess these small changes in the thoracic spine. And so is that the reason why we should be doing it? I would argue no. If a patient responds well to uh, a couple visits and, and manual therapy, I, I might use that. But Overall, we found from multiple studies that we've done, manual therapy to the thoracic spine in patients with shoulder pain doesn't change thoracic spine mobility. Their ability, when they raise their arm, their thoracic extension during arm raising doesn't change. It doesn't change their thoracic mobility overall, their amount of excursion when we look at how far their thoracic spine goes from flexion to extension. So it's likely and most of the evidence indicates that the effect of manual therapy is probably not as much local at the spine level, especially in that lumbar and thrust, uh, lumbar spine that people have looked at. With respect to shoulder pain then, does it have some central effect? That's likely where it resides. Um, we just looked at some EMG changes and it seems that this manual therapy does induce neuromuscular um, changes with respect to EMG activation. 
but the caveat is we looked at a sham versus a manipulation. And so what was the sham? It was putting them in the exact same position, putting our hands on them the exact same way, just no delivery of the thrust. And what we saw was same report in pain pre and post in both the sham and the manipulation group and the same amount of um, EMG activity. And so we think that likely um, just touching the patient may actually be as effective than the thrust employed. And we didn't imply, employ a thrust at any specific level as well with respect to where we thought that that problem was. We just employed a thrust across the thoracic spine. So gosh, it's a hard answer. Um, manual therapy, it may be beneficial, but it really may just be the manual contact with the patient. And frankly, it may be just the empathetic engagement that you're exuding when you're doing this manual therapy. That may be the magic piece of it. It's hard to say, but I don't think based on our work that thrust is the magic piece to it. Let's move on. We've got a, we've got a few minutes left. Let's make sure that we cover some return to sport tests mm -hmm. and progressions because I, I think this is something that is challenging for folks working with athletes. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us your approach to return to sport testing? What are the tests that you like to use? When and how do you progress an athlete back to return to sport? So early on, I, um, before we started doing this closed chain approach for full thickness tears, I used to think, why would I do this closed kinetic chain test or this Y balance test? Um, because they're not functioning in a closed chain. But that closed chain really has good activation. It's really assessing their ability to activate muscles and stability. So in particular, people with instability, that can be really good closed chain test, this Y balance or closed chain kinetic upper extremity tests. They can be really helpful. If you're looking for performance and measures, it could be that shot put test can be quite helpful. But realistically, I think it gets back to what is what are they trying to perform and really creating a performance test for that person individually. So I need to be able to do an overhead and a handball player. This is what I need to be able to do. Okay, I'm gonna load that in multiple ways in multiple different positions. That might be really helpful. Also, I'd like to have a, a mention of um, Margie Olds, uh, just this past year in 2019, I believe, in physical therapy and sport, a battery of sports tests that she's put out about reliability. We're not sure how well they accurately or, or constructability can demonstrate that people can return to sport quite yet, but they have really nice face validity and there's other ideas such as a ball on the wall example or an overhead snatch kind of activity, which can be really assessing that lower extremity trunk, upper extremity test as well. But Functional performance tests, there's some out there, but they, you, I, don't, I don't use just those. It's really performance towards what they need to be able to do. And are you bringing in strength testing as well into this return to sport ah. test group? Good, so the battery of tests. So let me ask you about your performance. Let me ask you about your confidence. And so we talked very early on about this OSPRO and use of understanding yellow flags and how that may impact the recovery and your overlay and rehabilitation and what you may interface with the patient about or refer for these yellow flags. When we get to the end, just like the ACL return um, RSI, is it RSI? Return to Sport Inventory, I believe it is. Um, that has some questions about confidence also asking the patient for upper extremity. We don't have a particular return to sport confidence index um, with instability in particular, or even rotator cuff tendinopathy or whatever else, but ask him, how confident are you that you think you can throw at 100% tomorrow? How confident are you ready to return? Those kinds of questions are critical in the battery. Ask about how often are they having symptoms and how long do those symptoms last? Again, I'm always on that two hour rule shouldn't be lasting more than that. After about of a couple days, is it, are you doing okay? Or now have you elevated to a new level of pain and stiffness and or feelings of instability? So asking both short-term and also over a couple days of symptoms, their confidence with returning, their strength assessment, obviously range of motion should obviously be in there, but I'm assuming they have full at this point. Um, their strength assessment, 
handheld dynamometry become really great. We um, are looking to understand what should be the ratio between internal and external and people with handball are looking at this. Tennis has looked at this. We're looking at with some baseball. Probably that 0.75 seems to be at that somewhat threshold external to internal. But um, interestingly, it's different in different position players that we're finding in baseball and different countries of origin. We're finding quite um, a bit differences between those. But I think handheld dynamometry, a must with external internal rotation ratio. I also think scaption is valuable. We've started looking at that. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of information out there, but I'd look at that as well with handheld dynamometry. Great summary. Thanks, Laurie. And one, mm -hmm. of the, one of the issues that came up when we had a chat with Lynn Snyder-Mackler a few weeks ago about return to sport and the ACL was about how often you do these tests. So are these return to sport tests a one-off or are these tests that you're doing as a, as a progression over a period of time before the athlete returns to full participation? Progression over a period of time. I might start looking at their ability to do this ball bounce if, if it's somebody returning to overhead, they might start, how do you feel there? How about if when you're in this position and more stable and I have them uh, facing to the side, okay, now I'm coming up into this. Now how are you feeling? So you're progressing that functional test. I put them in a just closed kinetic chain. Can you just touch to the other side and then progressing? Because they're also, most of these as I'm describing can also be exercises as well. Yeah, great. Now, I think we've got a few more minutes, so let's start to wrap up. And um, one of the challenges that many of our colleagues are facing at the moment is shifting practice from face-to-face mm. -to, -face to tele-rehab and having an online conversation like we're doing today. Have you got some tips for folks doing tele-rehab, particularly shoulder assessment and then um, progressing exercises as well? We should have had Chad Cook on here. He threw out a teaser on Twitter yesterday saying, um, he's looking at uh, the accuracy overall of doing a uh, self-assessment versus doing a clinical exam, meaning having the patient do their own self-assessment via telehealth, Zoom, Skype, whatever that uh, uh, venue is that you may do assessment with the patient at home. And they've looked at it with FAI and found the accuracy actually was a little bit better, shockingly, with patients doing their own self-assessment um, with respect to accuracy of the diagnosis of FAI. And he said, you know, the teaser was that maybe shoulder has the same answer. I think that we can easily have patients go through some exam and having them reproduce that. When I looked at the FAI article, I thought, oh, I, yeah, I think we could. And then and I thought to myself, oh, how could I do this Hawkins test? I guess I could. Yeah, I could have the patient. You could easily take them through you know, these major bucket categories and talk to them then about progression and reassessment as they progress as well. And exercise prescription via telehealth, some tips for folks, what sorts of exercises are easy to prescribe at home and progress at home for the shoulder? I think about giving them exercises to do that have one or, it's kind of like one or two step commands that I would give a, a patient in neuro rehab, I think about. I try to keep it pretty simple. And if I'm asking to do, like this I think is one of the most difficult exercises to teach patients resisted external rotation in an elevated position. Because they have to hold the elevated position. What plane do you want them in or do you care? And so really setting it up that, oh, I have them, oh, get on the back of a chair and think about, oh, then they only have one moving part or one step command. I think about giving people progression. And then the intuitive things, watching them do the exercise, are they performing it correctly, asking about symptoms as they do it, et cetera. Fantastic. Thanks, Laurie. And I should mention there was a great article in JSES, Journal of Shoulder and Elbow, that just came out about telerehabilitation for people with status post rotator cuff repair. And people did well. So there's, there's hope. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we're all, it's a brave new world we're in and um, challenging us all, mm -hmm. but also finding out that there's some really positive things to um, our progression moving forward. So mm -hmm. rather than it being a negative, I think there is lots of positives coming out of tele-rehab. Yes. Thanks for a wonderful and insightful discussion, Laurie. Um, the practical tips and, and hints for the clinician were, were terrific 